Hello. So welcome back again to the UCF uh, AVS Astrochemistry webinar. This is the week five Tuesday episode with Dr. Scott Sanford, Sanford from NASA Ames. And he'll be speaking on the unique scientific value of returned samples. This is brought to you again by uh, the University of Central Florida's American Vacuum Society chapter. Uh, I'm the chair and uh, Katie Slavichinska, the uh, co-organizer, is the vice chair. The format again is going to be a 40 minute talk with 15 minute Q&A session afterwards where you can write your questions in the chat and they'll be answered as, uh, as they get asked. So today's speaker, again, as I said, was doc is Dr. Scott Sanford from the Astrochemistry and Astrophysics Laboratory at NASA Ames. He'll be speaking on the unique scientific value of returned samples. Dr. Sanford is a member of the Astrophysics Branch at NASA Ames Research Center, where he has worked for the past 34 years, is a co-leader of, of Ames Astrochemistry and Astrophysics Laboratory, and is currently serving as NASA's Senior Laboratory Astrophysicist. He earned a BS degree in mathematics and physics from the New, uh, the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology in 1978. He subsequently earned MA and PhD degrees in physics from Washington University in St. Louis, where he was a member of the McDonnell Center for Space Sciences and studied meteorites and interplanetary dust particles collected by NASA U-2 aircraft from the upper atmosphere. He has over 35 years of experience in the fields of meteoritics, is an associate editor of the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, and has helped find many meteorites in Antarctica. Dr. Sanford also does extensive work in the areas of laboratory astrophysics, astrochemistry, and astrobiology, and participates in infrared astronomy studies using ground-based airborne and space-borne observatories. He has used the combined techniques of infrared astronomy, laboratory astrophysics, to identify a number of new molecular species in space, many of interest to exobiology. Dr. Sanford was a co-investigator on NASA's successful Stardust mission, which, collected, uh, which returned collected samples to Earth from Comet Wild 2, and JAX's Hayabusa mission, which returned samples to Earth from asteroid Itokawa. He is currently serving as a co-I on a NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, which will be returning samples to Earth from asteroid Bennu, and will play a role in the analysis of samples brought back to Earth from asteroid Ryugu by JAX's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. He has also, also served as the principal, he's also serving as the principal investigator on a number of space infrared observatory mission concepts and comet sample return mission concepts. In recognition of his work on extraterrestrial materials, asteroid 16035, S.A. Sanford was named for him in 2004. So without further ado, I will stop my screen sharing and uh, let Dr. Sanford take it away. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, so it was interesting looking at that picture of me while you were introducing me. That's back from the days of haircuts and things. That was, <laughs> okay, so I, I hit share screen, right? Yep. Okay, and then let's get my talk up. All right, is everybody seeing that? No. You're not seeing the screen? We are not. Okay, let me share screen again. Oh, I see. Maybe I have to push on this and share that. Now, are you seeing it? Now we are. Okay. Okay, and let me hide the images here so I can see the full screen. Uh, okay, somehow I'm on a way into the paper here. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, so yeah, I've been asked to talk about the scientific value of return samples, which is a subject near and dear to my heart. I'm largely going to spend most of my time talking about two missions that have already flown and been completed because they give me the best opportunity to show some of the results that come from the return samples that sort of highlight what the value of these kinds of missions are. But I will end uh, talking uh, a brief more, somewhat more briefly about two ongoing missions, Hibusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx, which are in flight now, which will be bringing back uh, samples for future studies. Okay. Uh, so one of the best ways to understand an object is to establish its composition. If you know what it's made of, you can learn a lot of things about it. Um, 
including things like the conditions under which it formed, the starting materials from which it was originally created, uh, the evolutionary history of the object since it was created. This can give you clues about its alteration history, space exposure, impacts, things like this. And in most cases, if you have sufficient sample, uh, you can learn a lot of the chronology of major events in the object's history. And that chronology can either be absolute chronology, finding out, you know, like the date an, uh, a, a meteorite uh, parent body formed, or it can be a relative chronology. So, you, know, you can learn something happened before something else happened. Um, and so for many objects in space, the only way we have of determining their compositions is through remote sensing. I mean, if you're interested, um, one of the things I do for my laboratory astrochemistry is I work on analogs of interstellar ices. If you're interested in what the ices are in an interstellar dense molecular cloud, we don't have any samples from those. You can only uh, learn what you can learn through a telescope. And that imposes some very serious limitations on what you can learn because you're just measure, able to measure photons that come from the object. Uh, that material you're interested in. But in some cases, you know, for solar system objects, we can actually get samples from an object. And this allows us to understand the object in a, at a level of detail that um, you wouldn't get any other way. Uh, and in particular, I'll be talking about samples that come from comets and asteroids. Uh, so it, I'm particularly interested in the origin of the solar system. And so, um, I, I want to, I'm most interested in objects that are primitive in the sense that they have not been heavily processed since they were formed. So um, if you want to know about the early solar system, looking at materials from the earth isn't a great way to go because there are no rocks on the earth that have survived from the origin of the earth that have witnessed that. I, I'm not knocking planets. They're a great place to set down your beer when you need to get more potato chips. But um, if you want to really understand the raw stuff from which everything was made, you'd rather go to uh, objects like comets and asteroids where you haven't had all the kinds of processes that happen on planets. You haven't had tons of weather. Uh, um, you haven't had Caltrain's paving things over. You haven't farmers plowing things under and so on. And we do get samples from both of these primitive types of objects. We get uh, dust from comets and asteroids in the form of dust that enters the upper atmosphere and which can be collected by high altitude aircraft, as you can see here um, in the lower middle. Um, in addition, we get meteorites from asteroids and these can of course fall everywhere on the earth, but a particularly good place to get them is in Antarctica. Here's a picture I took of a colleague uh, with a, a rather large uh, meteorite found in Antarctica. And so we get these samples for free in a sense. And so uh, not surprisingly, much of what we know about extraterrestrial materials in the solar system comes from these kinds of, of samples. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about meteorites in Antarctica first. Um, that was mentioned in the introduction. I've been down there a number of times. Much of our current inventory of meteorites comes from Antarctica. And so it's a fair question to ask, well, you know, why to go to Antarctica given the obvious hazards and difficulties here, you know, on the left we see a, uh, an, an investigator hanging on for dear life so he doesn't fall off the bottom of the world. Uh, and here in the middle, here's me getting ready to go over a ledge into a crevasse, not because we think there are meteorites down there, but because you need to get survival training um, to operate safely down there. Uh, for those of you who are into geology, I'll just notice right above the horizon here, you can see smoke that's from an active volcano, Mount Erebus. And uh, you know, here on the right, we see an Imperial Stormtrooper assaulting a camp. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm, I'm joking with you here about these hazards, well, the crevasse is a real one. <laughs> um, uh, so, but why go to Antarctica for meteorites? Meteorites fall pretty much equally everywhere on the planet. So what are the advantages? Uh, so I'm now going to pull your leg a little bit more. It's, you know, because the air is clear. Here we see a group of uh, uh, adventurers uh, scanning the skies. Uh, over here on the right, we see a uh, meteorite's been spotted. Someone is sent to go capture it. And here's the triumphant, crew with the meteorite. Uh, so obviously not true. <laughs> uh, but that is what, the real reason you find lots of meteorites in Antarctica is, uh, is um, well, there's multiple reasons really. One is, of course, temperatures are very cold there. So meteorites that fall are preserved for a long time. A meteorite that lands in California may only be recognizable as a meteorite for, you know, 100 years or less, whereas in Antarctica, they can be preserved for up to a million years in recognizable form. Also, the ice flow dynamics actually concentrate fallen meteorites. They fall on the surface in Antarctica at the same sort of rate they fall anywhere else. But if they land in the interior of the continent, they'll land in the snow. The snow, uh, they slowly get buried. Uh, the snow gets compressed into ice, and then the meteorites are entrained in the glacial flow that just heads downhill. So most meteorites in Antarctica ultimately end up 
um, being dumped in the ocean uh, after spending some time in an iceberg. But there are zones in Antarctica where the ice flow runs into a barrier. And if the ice is thrust up into the winds, which are extremely dry, um, the humidity in Antarctica is the lowest, it's the lowest uh, continent uh, for, with regards to humidity, the ice just ablates away like it does in your frost-free freezer and the meteorites just flow to the top and just accumulate on the surface. So you have a kind of conveyor belt that accumulates meteorites. So on the right here, you can see a satellite picture. This is the Trans-Antarctic Mountains or the dark things. Uh, in the very upper right is uh, sea ice um, uh, to the ocean. And then all these blue patches are places where ice is being ablated away at the surface. And meteorites, this is the Allen Hills area. This is the Allen Hills right here where I'm moving my cursor. Um, and meteorites have been found in all of these blue ice patches. In fact, Allen Hills 84001, which probably many of you are familiar with, the Martian meteorite that was suggested to harbor life, um, was actually found right about here at, this, at the lower end of this ice field here. And of course, the, the final uh, good reason for finding uh, that what's good to hunt for meteorites in Antarctica is because you don't have to be all that bright to recognize dark rocks on blue ice. So they're, they're easy to spot and they can often be spotted uh, from a distance and a really, really nice rock and roll kind of place. Uh, you may be able to stand on the seat of your snowmobile with binoculars and, and recognize 10 meteorites in different directions from where you're standing. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, the U.S. runs a program called ANSMET, which uh, goes down every year that it can to collect meteorites. As you can see, a large fraction of the best spots are along the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Ranges because this is where you have the right conditions for ice flow to run into barriers like the Trans-Antarctic Mountains and give you these uh, blue ice patches. And um, a, a couple of the more famous meteorites from these uh, uh, can be seen in the pictures below. There's Allen Hills 84001. I was a member of the team that found this in the Allen Hills on the 84-85 field season. Um, the one on the right, McAlpin Hills 88105, is uh, one I found uh, several years later. And for a long time, this was the world's largest lunar meteorite. I don't think that's true anymore. They've probably been bigger ones found. Um, so, uh, but this uh, is a lunar meteorite that uh, comes from some place different from the Apollo sites and therefore can be used to tell us something about the moon that we couldn't have gotten from the Apollo samples. Uh, so unfortunately, all of these samples, whether they're collected in Antarctica or elsewhere or in the stratosphere by E2 aircraft, all of these samples are orphans. We don't know exactly where they come from. Um, in many cases, based on the nature of what we can measure, we can make guesses that you know this particular dust grain is probably from a comet, this one may be from an asteroid, and so on. There are a few exceptions. So for example, the Allen Hills 84001 we know comes from Mars, uh, but even then we don't know where on Mars it comes from. So uh, while you can learn a ton from these samples, you can't always put all that information into complete context because you don't really know what, uh, where it came from specifically. So ideally, if you want to really understand a sample, you'd like to go to its source, grab a sample, and, 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 and since you're there, you can maybe even grab what you think is the ideal sample and bring it back to Earth. Then you can make all the same kinds of measurements you make on collected dust or meteorites, but um, you, you can put it into context. So this is where sample return missions come in. So there are a, a number of advantages to sample return missions. Um, since you're bringing the sample back to Earth to study it, you can do the studies using state-of-the-art analytical techniques and equipment, which give you, you know, whatever the current ultimate uh, precision, sensitivity, resolution, reliability, et cetera, you have. If you're sending instruments to the object to make in situ measurements, it, these instruments um, are going to arrive with somewhat older technology because you have to pick them and build them and launch them and fly them there. And so they're never going to be state of the art. Um, uh, in addition, of course, uh, as is listed in the fourth item here, uh, a sample return avoids limitations associated with cost, power, mass, and reliability. Um, if you're going to fly something to an object, then you, you, it can't weigh much and it can't use much power because you have uh, constraints associated with the spacecraft's resources. Uh, however, if you bring it back to the Earth, then you don't have those constraints. So some of the instruments used to study the Stardust samples, for example, are not just bigger than the Stardust spacecraft, they're bigger than the launch pad from which the spacecraft left. And so that allows you to use a lot of techniques that you would never fly on a spacecraft. Uh, also, as, as mentioned in the second item here, and this is a really important one, return samples are a resource not just for current studies, but for future studies. 
after you've measured the return samples, they are kept in a curatorial facility and are available for study into the future. Uh, so this means that as you develop new techniques or better techniques or more sensitive techniques, you can take the samples out and remeasure them. Also, as your understanding of an object improves and you come up with new questions, you can again pull the samples out and address the new questions. Uh, whereas if you're uh, um, uh, totally doing in situ measurements, you get there and you um, make your measurements and then the spacecraft eventually you know dies and then you're not going to learn anything more until you send another spacecraft uh, another advantage is that the analyses can be iterative and fully adaptive so you can make a measurement in a laboratory and on the basis of that information if new uh, new analyses are suggested you can just go do them if you're doing it in situ work you may not have that opportunity. So before you fly a spacecraft to an object, you have to have a discussion about what's the most critical instrument to fly on it. And you may decide that the main thing we need to do when we get to this object is measure the value of B. So you put a B measuring machine on your spacecraft and you get there and you measure B. But if, if the outcome of what you get for B is su suggested as what you really should have measured as A, you're kind of done until you send another spacecraft. Uh, with an A measuring machine, but if you have the sample in your lab and you measure B and it suggests you should measure A, then you no big deal. You go down the hallway to the A measuring machine and you get on with it. And of course, finally, the analyses can be replicated and verified because you have samples. You can distribute them to lots of different people and they can all make measurements and you can um, get all the scientific interchange, which is one of the main ways you make progress is to have the discussion between a lot, multiple people working on the, in the, on the problem. So, so basically, when you bring a sample back, the mission's payload now essentially becomes all the world's analytical instrumentation. So that's a huge advantage. So I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about two past uh, sample return missions uh, that have completed. And so I can give examples of how this return sample has changed our understanding of things. One is the Stardust mission, which went to a comet uh, uh, who's actually pronounced Vilt2. It's named after a Swiss gentleman who discovered it. He, his main uh, interest was to find supernova in uh, external galaxies, and he had an automated measuring technique where it would flag potential uh, supernova, and he found the comet in this, and uh, he thought he had a supernova, uh, he thought the nucleus in the fuzzy patch might be a supernova in the galaxy, but then the whole galaxy moved sideways while he watched, so he realized get a comet and uh, so even though we were going to a comet to get a sample uh, from a comet named after him it, it, we invited him out to lunch at the launch to talk about how he had discovered this and it was quite clear that he was still actually disappointed it wasn't a supernova so everybody has their own interests I guess um, and Hayabusa went to an asteroid called Itakawa and so I'll be talking about both of these in some detail now so uh, Stardust took advantage of uh, Comet VILT-2's wild ride through the solar system. Prior to 74, VILT-2 was in this yellow orbit here, which took it into the outer solar system at its most distance from the sun. And at its closest, it got right down to Jupiter's orbit. And this orbit is a strong indication that the comet had had an encounter with Jupiter at some time in the past, and Jupiter had bent its orbit into this, this orbit. Well, in this kind of an orbit, it has a chance to encounter Jupiter over and over and over again. And on September 10th of 1974, it in fact did that. And Jupiter changed its orbit yet again into the, this little interior red orbit, which was a big advantage for us for sample return because um, uh, now the orbit gets down very much closer to the Earth, so it makes it much easier to get to. Um, in addition, these encounters with Jupiter probably, you know, shifted the orbit so that it was more in the ecliptic uh, plane. Uh, and both of these make it just much more easy to get a spacecraft to it in terms of the orbital dynamics. So now I'm, the next slide, I'm going to zoom in on this little red orbit in the middle here to show you what... Um, uh, what our spacecraft's trajectory looked like. So now the red orbit is still VILT-2. Um, so out here at the most distant is that about Jupiter. And then here you can see the Earth's orbit in yellow. So the spacecraft was launched into an orbit that just basically loitered around to bring us back to the Earth for an Earth gravity assist. And that now put us into an orbit that now crossed uh, uh, the comet's orbit here. Uh, unfortunately, the first time we got here, the comet was up here someplace. And so we had to go around a whole second time, uh, did not encounter the Earth um, the second time back. And then on the third orbit out, we encountered the comet here. And it was a flyby, we did not rendezvous with it. We flew by it at a little over six kilometers a second, collected dust from the comet's coma, 
And then uh, went our separate ways uh, afterwards and the spacecraft came back on the end of the third orbit, Earth was here again and we dropped off the capsule. The spacecraft was diverted to miss the Earth and then went on to actually have a second life as a mission that went to another comet. So in these three orbits, the spacecraft traveled a total of 2.88 billion miles. Um, so that's an average cost of about seven cents a mile. Uh, and we launched from Florida in 1999 and landed in Utah in 2006. So, I mean, to be honest, there are easier ways to get from Florida to Utah. Here's just one that MapQuest gave me. Um, and uh, if you look at this, you see that while we went 2.88 billion miles, uh, Stardust average terrestrial velocity was only about 0.04 miles per hour. So you could have easily witnessed the launch and then crawled on your hands and knees to witness the recovery. Um, uh, but it's not just the, uh, the, the beginning and ending points, it's also the trip. <laughs> um, and again, Stardust cost about seven cents a mile, which is well under go government travel per diem limits. I cost a lot more than that when they send me someplace back in the old days when they used to send me places. Uh, so financially, this was a, actually a fairly cheap mission as missions go. So I'm not going to talk in gruesome detail about the spacecraft, but I do want to point out two um, key attributes. One is since we flew by this comet at six kilometers a second, that's something like Mach 20, uh, passing through the coma was uh, fraught with peril because if we hit anything large, it would have been moving at a high enough speed to damage the spacecraft. So the leading edges of the spacecraft all are covered by, protected by Whipple shields, which are basically um, a couple of uh, metal plates and Nextel fiber sheets, which is like a kind of like the material and bulletproof vests. And so these are designed specifically to protect the uh, hidden spacecraft behind them from uh, high energy impacts that would have damaged things. So very little things, uh, very little of the spacecraft peaked out around these shields. One of the things that peaked out was the actual collector for the comet dust we brought back. And so I'll show you a picture of the actual collector here in a moment, but it's basically looked a little bit like a tennis racket that pe peaked up over the top of the Whipple shield. So grains would come flying in from this direction, whoops, and smash into the aerogel. And then when the fl uh, flyby was over, this whole thing was folded up into the sample return capsule, the clamshell closed, the spacecraft came back to the earth and this part of the spacecraft then was released to come back to the earth. So here's a, an electron microscope image of uh, aerogel. It's basically fluffy glass. It's mostly void space with these filaments of glass holding together. And it's, uh, I believe it holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the lowest density solid, but you can make it um, at extremely low densities. And then if you make tiles or blocks of this, these can be loaded into an array and represent, uh, so here's a picture of the Stardust Collector and you can see it consists of a whole series of aerogel tiles that have been pushed into a frame here. And so this is the view comet dust would have seen as it was coming towards the spacecraft and if, if it was gonna hit the collector. Okay, um, all right, I've got some problems with controlling the direction I go as I move the mouse. So, uh, and uh, just to explain how this works, I mean, I just talked about how particles hitting the spacecraft could cause a huge amount of damage. So how do we collect them without causing damage? Because uh, if you took it six kilometers a second, a dust grain and ran it into an aluminum plate, you'd get a crater like this one over on the right. Most of the material is vaporized and what little material is left behind is probably is mostly altered. And so um, it, you're not gonna be able to measure a pristine sample. But in the case of aerogel, you have a low density solid. So the particle hits it and it doesn't stop on a dime and it instead penetrates like you're shooting a BB into, you know, uh, Styrene, uh, polystyrene foam or something. And that slower deceleration causes less damage. And I think you have, you know, everybody will have an intuitive sense for that. If you're in a bus that's, uh, you know, a runaway bus that doesn't have brakes, um, and someone asks you, would you rather stop the bus by running into a brick wall or a giant pile of pillows? I'm sure you'll all pick the pillows because you intuitively understand that slowing over a distance is a far less violent affair. So that's basically how aerogel worked. Um, so as we flew by Stardust, we had sensors on the front that could measure the impacts of things running into that front Whipple Shield uh, um, device. And uh, on the basis of that, we knew we'd collected samples. And this plot here in the lower right shows um, uh, along the horizontal axis time, uh, the closest approach to the comet is at time zero down here. The uh, axis sticking out of the graph uh, out of the page here is the size of the particle and the, 
axis vertically sticking up is the rate at which things were coming. And you can see we received a lot of particles, more small ones than big ones, but we did get some big ones. It's a good thing we had the Whipple Shield. There were a number of impacts that were big enough that had we not had the Whipple Shields, we very well could have suffered a, a serious problem. Uh, the spacecraft was, uh, the SRC sample return capsule was returned uh, to land in the Utah Test and Training Range, which is up here in the northwestern corner of Utah. Uh, these are often referred to as dry lake beds, which is a bit of a misnomer because they're not generally lakes and they're often not dry. <laughs> we came back in the winter and so they weren't dry. The, all of these lake beds were uh, uh, consisted of a very sticky cloying mud. Uh, but there are advantages to coming back to a place like this. It's highly instrumented airspace. Things don't land here without people knowing about it. The terrain is quite flat. There's no, almost no vegetation. So it's easy to spot things like spacecraft lying around. There are trained facilities uh, and personnel there. There's few people or buildings to land on. Um, there are some disadvantages. Of course, one was this issue of potential for standing water. And the other is since this is a military test and training range, um, there is the possibility of unexploded ordnance. So um, I was on the recovery team and one of the training sessions we had to do was to learn how to recognize unexploded ordnance and then how to deal with it. And uh, for untrained people like me, how to deal with it didn't take a lot of training because the basic answer is stay far away from it. Okay, so the capsule landed in the, uh, successfully. Um, we had done tests before we launched to find out how the capsule would likely land in a crosswind, whether it would end up on its nose cone or its back or its side. Those tests indicated that the answer was um, yes, it will land on one of those <laughs> and end up. Uh, and then one of those tests had actually hit and skipped and rolled like a quarter across the desert. And we thought, well, that was an anomalous run. That won't happen. So as you can see from the tracks in the mud, that's exactly what did happen. This uh, white patch here is, shows that it landed on the nose cone and bounced, uh, probably bounced uh, two, three times. You can see here's some more white where it landed uh, after one of those bounces on its rim. And then the track over here on the left shows how it rolled along the desert, eventually laid on its side and did a little circle and came to a halt. Um, I think if I can get this to work, here's some video footage I took of the capsule. And you'll see as the light changes, you can see the track in the background here, you can even see that um, right, uh, right in here is when it was rolling on the front edge and rolled back to roll along the back edge and then rolled back to the front edge and then finally went into a circle. Uh, but as you can see, the capsule was whole and amazingly enough, even though the mud that's on the ground stuck to our boots like crazy, it did not stick to the capsule. So we did not have a big problem with mud on the capsule, which was a huge relief. And uh, once we had opened up the, uh, the capsule, taken out the sample container, and then gotten the sample grid out, we could see that we'd been successful. There were some visible impacts on the aerogel uh, that we could see with a naked eye. And then, of course, then once we could remove cells and look at them through microscopes and so on, we found many more. <clears throat> there were two main kinds of um, tracks in the, in the sample. There's uh, these big blobby things with uh, um, separate tracks coming out the bottom. This is implicating, uh, so this, this would have been the front surface of the aerogel. The particles would have been coming in from uh, right to left. Uh, in any case, a lot of the particles were composite particles that hit the aerogel, broke into pieces, and then the pieces went every which way. Uh, but there are also some tracks, like this one, at the smaller one at the top, which we call a carrot track, in which you just see a long, thin track with a particle at the end. And so this was probably a grain that consisted of a, 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 a single mineral grain that did not break apart after it hit. So I'm gonna go through a, a brief top 10 uh, or top hits list for what we learned from the samples. So uh, one of the things that was immediately obvious is that the samples from VILT-2 are largely unprocessed protosolar nebular materials. So you can see a distribution of minerals and organics whose abundance and composition is heterogeneous both within the individual grains and between different particles. So they represent a highly unequilibrated reservoir of material. So here's just a, a perfect example grain of that. You have a, a, a large area that's iron sulfide, then you have a chunk that is a pyroxene, uh, and then you have some material in the back which contains organics which is fine grained and overall has a, so a more or less solar composition. So there's just no way these things were made in the same place uh, at the same time. And so the fact that they've all been next to each other without having interacted much suggests that most of these materials experience very little parent body processing after they were incorporated into the comet. In addition, um, there's a, just an amazing diversity of materials in the samples. So you have everything from, uh, 
organic carbon and uh, that contains um, isotopically anomalous, anomalous hydrogen and nitrogen, which implies generally is thought to be caused by chemical processing in very low temperature environments, all the way up to grains of vanadium titanium nitride, which is one of the first things that would condense out of a gas of solar composition if you were cooling it down from you know, thousands of degrees uh, centigrade. So again, there's just no way these things formed in the same place and at, probably not at the same time. So this means, and, but they all ended up in the comet. So this tells you that the protosolar nebula must have been experiencing a huge amount of mixing and this must have spanned essentially the entire extent of the disk prior to the formation of the comet because the comet was ultimately made from materials that came from the entire solar nebula. So um, one of my big interests is astrobiology and organics. Organics are present in the samples and in fact, glycine was identified in the aerogel. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all the details here, but to just point out that the organics are generally quite rich in oxygen and nitrogen. They're both aromatic rich and aromatic poor organics present. And uh, if you look at this, um, plot here in the lower left, you can see uh, the oxygen to carbon and nitrogen to carbon ratios for organics and most meteorites are right down here near the origin. Primitive meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, have more oxygen and nitrogen relative to carbon, but then you can see the kind of <laughs> zone in which the comet grains are falling as well as average interplanetary dust particles. So this really suggests that these organics are, many of them are quite primitive and have not been heavily reprocessed um, since they were made. Uh, one of the ideas that some people had for comets was that they might be consist almost entirely of interstellar materials that got into the outer solar nebula and were, were not processed at all and got put into a comet. And so if this were true, you would expect a comet to be an assemblage of, of pre-solar materials. But most of the materials in the samples are crystalline. They look very meteoritic in composition and uh, their isotopic composition is solar. So there are anomalous, uh, isotopically anomalous grains that suggest there are circumstellar grains that they were, you know, that their isotopes are associated with nucleosynthesis, but their abundance isn't any higher than they are in normal meteorites. And so comets are definitely not just assemblages of interstellar materials. Um, however, deuterium and nitrogen 15 enrichments are, in, are seen in the organics um, and they're not uncommon and uh, they come in hot spots. You often see little zones that are very enriched in these, just like you do in meteorites. And so this suggests that while circumstellar grains are rare in the sense they're rare in meteorites, <clears throat> um, interstellar and protostellar materials are less so, but still the abundances of all these kinds of anomalies isn't radically different from what you see in many primitive meteorites. So the implication is that most of the materials in the comet are not um, pre-solar. Uh, most of the material actually was involved in the processing within the solar protosolar nebula. Uh, so just as a summary, uh, it's quite clear that all these unincorporated phases together tell you that a whole lot of mixing was going on in the early solar nebula and that it, it expanded the, pretty much the entire range of the disk. Uh, and so as a result, comets, even though they formed in the outer uh, solar nebula, actually contain materials from both the inner and outer portions of that nebula. Uh, and, but once they were assembled, not much happened to them after that. So they do represent a, a reservoir of primitive materials that sample much of the disk, if not the whole disk. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to Hayabusa, uh, which went uh, to an asteroid called Itakawa. You can see a picture of Itakawa down here at the bottom. Uh, the, the sampling concept for Hayabusa was different. It actually rendezvoused with the asteroid and then the plan is to do a touchdown and fire a gun into the surface, which would spray material up a collection horn into the capsule. And ultimately for Hayabusa, that system didn't totally work, but it's the spacecraft still returned sample. And it's a great example of how even a small amounts of sample can lead to a major improvements in our understanding of things. So Itakawa is not a very large asteroid and it's a rubble pile asteroid. It looks like it's an assemblage of smaller objects that were assembled from the breakup of an earlier object. Uh, this is the size of Itakawa, roughly to scale to the Golden Gate Bridge just north of me. Um, hopefully none of you ever actually see these two juxtaposed like this because the, ne <laughs> the next couple of nanoseconds would be pretty bad, um, or milliseconds, uh, but uh, it's, it's only a half a kilometer from end to end. So it's a, a very small object. In fact, here's another way to scale it. There's the Interstellar, the International Space Station uh, relative to Itakawa. Uh, 
So uh, as I said, it appears to be a rubble pile. It has few craters and lots of boulders. And this, the overall structure really suggests that um, there is a sort of hierarchical root collection of, of smaller objects from a previous impact. Um, I'll just point out here in this upper middle picture, that dark spot right there is the shadow of the spacecraft on the asteroid to give you a little bit of a sense of the scale of things. Uh, the spacecraft took along a spectrometer, which allowed it to measure in the, uh, in the near IR, and that spectrum is a very good fit to those of ordinary chondrites. In fact, if you look at the band depths of things, you find out that the spectra squarely place um, the asteroid in the field of, the, of LL ordinary chondrites. The asteroids are class S. People thought class S's were ordinary chondrite type materials to begin with, and so this was a great confirmation of that. Uh, and represents sort of the first really, uh, um, you know, the first time that we really nailed a connection between an asteroid type and uh, in the spectral databases and uh, meteorites. So, okay, as I mentioned, uh, the sampling was a bump and go thing that was just supposed to fire a gun. Unfortunately, the sampling didn't go perfectly. Um, the spacecraft approached the asteroid. Here you can see the whole asteroid. This little box is this box. Uh, here you can see the spacecraft's shadow and a little target marker it had dropped earlier to help navigate down. This uh, rectangular box is now this box in the lower left, and this box is this box. And so this is roughly the, this is I think the closest image that was taken. This is a meter scale bar, so you can see the surface at this point uh, was covered by a small gravel basically. Uh, unfortunately, uh, after this, contact was lost with the spacecraft and it wasn't regained for a long time. And when uh, they did regain contact, it, the spacecraft was not in great shape. But through um, just brilliant work by uh, JAXA um, mission members, uh, they managed to get the spacecraft back to the Earth. It, it's uh, given that it was it had problems with gyros, didn't have a working battery, it was out of chemical propellants, the ion engines were cranky. <laughs> uh, they managed to get it back. It's, it was a real testament to uh, their uh, perseverance and endurance. And even though it wasn't clear whether the gun had fired or not, they knew they'd hit the surface, so there was a chance there would be sample in the collector. So, so they, they went to the effort to bring it back. And uh, since there was no chemical propellant, they couldn't uh, release the capsule and divert the spacecraft away from the Earth. So the whole thing came into the Earth's atmosphere together. So on this top picture in the lower right, you can see the capsule uh, entering. And then up above is the debris of the spacecraft uh, breaking up as it as entered the atmosphere and uh, broke up and burned up. But the capsule made it down to the ground um, in perfect shape and uh, was taken to, to a special uh, clean room in Japan to be opened up. Um, I'll let you guess which one of these people is me, uh, but this is right after we successfully opened the capsule. And uh, uh, when we first looked in the canisters, it seemed to be empty, but um, actually getting down into the level of microscopic dust, we started finding things. And when these were studied uh, initially using uh, um, getting EDEX data from an electron microscope, we realized we in fact had samples of Itakawa. Uh, this picture on the left is one of my favorites. This is, uh, was taken shortly after we realized we were really looking at a piece of Itakawa, but it was decided this uh, photo lacked the dignity for a press release, so we had to take the picture on the right, um, but I like the one on the left personally. Um, so here's some examples of Hayabusa grains. You can tell they're very different from the kind of grain I showed you for stardust. Instead of being made up of thousands of submicron grains, um, we have much bigger mineral crystals. This is not unexpected for uh, meteoritic material from an asteroid. And the total number of returned grains is about the same as it was for stardust, probably a couple thousand grains. And um, I'm just going to hit some highlights again for it. Uh, if you look at the minerals that are in the grains, you find out that the minerals and their exact compositions are again a very good fit for LL, uh, LL ordinary chondrites. So we got a great uh, match uh, both spectrally and compositionally. Um, so that really nails down this connection between LL ordinary chondrites and the S-class asteroids. 
Um, and we know that uh, even though there are contaminants present, that many of these dust grains are from Itakawa because they show non-terrestrial oxygen isotopes, they have embedded solar wind gases, there's evidence for space weathering, the mineralogy fits ordinary chondrites uh, very well. And interestingly enough, even though we only got back grains that are on the orders of tens of microns, one can look at the minerals and establish a thermal history for the grains and demonstrate that these grains had to have once been part of a much larger parent body, something on the order of at least 20 kilometers in diameter. So given that Itakawa is only a half a kilometer, this tells you that Itakawa is literally a tiny fragment or a remnant of a much larger body that was broken up. Uh, and renewable gases and space weathering imply a fairly young surface uh, and uh, not unexpectedly, no indigenous organics have been found in the samples and uh, LL ordinary chondrites are not the place to go to find organics. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, briefly about current missions. Um, the, the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission went to Ryugu and got samples successfully and is on its way back to Earth. I'm not gonna to say too much more about it, although I will show you a picture of Ryugu as an, uh, the asteroid later. I'm mostly gonna take my remaining time, which is running out, uh, to talk about another mission, which is currently in flight, which is OSIRIS-REx. This is a NASA mission that went to, is at an asteroid called Bennu. Um, we're preparing later this year to go get the sample, and then we'd be returning that sample to Earth in uh, September of 2023. So I'll go straight to OSIRIS-REx. So the acronym is uh, long and complex. Here's are what all the letters stand for. And uh, I will hit on aspects of, of all of these uh, um, uh, subjects that the spacecraft is addressing um, as I go through my subsequent slides. So here's a little animation. Uh, maybe you'll even hear a little music, I don't know. It just shows the number of known asteroids as they were discovered. Down here is the year and the number of known asteroids. The flashes are when an asteroid is detected and identified, and then it just joins the pool of green floating objects. The Earth's orbit is down in here. If you pay attention out here, you'll actually see there's a Jupiter going by. So you'll see that there are some discoveries 60 degrees off for the Trojans. See, there's a bunch right there. And uh, this thing only goes up through, uh, I think it's going to end soon, 2008 or something. Um, so there have been many, many more discovered since then. So the question is, how, out of all these asteroids, how do you decide which one Osiris Rex should go to? Well, we're interested in ones that are in here that are red, the near-Earth asteroids, for multiple reasons. They're easier to get to. They also tend to represent larger hazards with regards to impact hazards with the Earth. And so from all of these, we picked um, Bennu. Um, you know, so here's just a, a, a summary showing you um, how the, the near-Earth uh, asteroids here in red uh, here's Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury, and then here's Pluto, or Pluto, Jupiter out here. And again, this is an older uh, slide, so there's far more than this already known. Now, so we actually knew a lot about our target asteroid after we picked it. Um, uh, it was, it comes close enough to the Earth that it could be imaged with radar, and so we could get radar returns off of it. This allowed us to get a lot of detail, like, you know, get its diameter down to plus or minus 20 meters. It's about a half a kilometer across, so its width is about the same as the length of Itakawa. It's clearly spheroidal, has, shows a slight equatorial belt. The infrared spectra suggested it was similar to a carbonaceous chondrite and so on. So we had, a, we, and has very low albedo. It's a very dark object. So we knew Quite a bit about it and we had a good sense that it would have sampleable material on it and that it would probably be primitive material similar to carbonaceous chondrites which is great in the sense that the sample would be expected then to contain organics which is of great interest in terms of understanding how these kinds of materials may play a role in getting life started on the earth. Uh, also Bennu comes very close to the earth I'll talk about this a little more later and so it has the highest impact uh, probability of, with the earth of a known asteroid of this size so it represents an actual impact hazard, which is another good reason to want to understand it. So here's a few pictures of the launch. Uh, the space, the uh, rocket only had one external booster, so it gives it a kind of asymmetric look to the plume, which is interesting. Launch went great. Uh, we have cameras on board that took pictures of some of the launch uh, process. Here's the spacecraft detaching over here. And uh, we took a selfie of ourselves. Uh, there's a camera that looks at the sample return capsule, and we can verify it came through the launch in good shape and we'll use this camera later to ensure that the capsule is properly closed after we get a sample. So uh, we have a lot of instruments on board. I'm not going to go to them into most of them in great detail, but there's a, a whole suite of cameras. Uh, there's a ra laser ranger finder. 
Uh, we have two spectrometers on board, one that does the, uh, the near infrared and one that does the farther infrared. Uh, uh, and we can, of course, do radio science. And then there's a student instrument on board which uses high energy photons to calculate, to determine elemental abundances from the asteroid. So I'm, but I'm mostly gonna dwell, uh, focus on the, uh, the sample and its composition. So, uh, so how do we catch the sample? Uh, we use something called the touch and go sample acquisition system. I have a little video here that shows how it works. So uh, it's basically a collector on the end of a long arm. And uh, when the arm is deployed, the spacecraft can go down and touch the collector against the surface. And uh, when it touches, it fires a gas bottle of uh, ultra clean nitrogen, which blows uh, material into the head. And the head can, contains a filter around that outer circumference and that collects the material. And, um, and then we bring it back and stow it in the capsule. Now, I want you to remember what the artist's conception of what the surface of the asteroid looked like. It was kind of a smooth, rounded, dusty plain. Uh, when you, we see real pictures of the surface, you'll see that that's not exactly what we have to deal with. All right, so then once everything's stowed, the capsule can be closed up. And then once we've confirmed that's in good shape, the spacecraft comes back to Earth. We are targeted at the limb of the Earth so we can release the capsule. Uh, the spacecraft is then diverted to miss the Earth. The capsule comes in um, and um, arrives uh, to the second when we uh, need it to, to land in the Utah Test and Training Range. So even though the mission uh, return is a long ways away, we know pretty much to the second when it's going to get back because the orbital dynamics and the entry into UTTR demand it. So here's a sort of cross section of the head just to explain a little bit better how we do the collection. When you touch the surface down at the bottom, uh, gas is blown into tubes that blow it out the bottom and create a vortex under here, which sweeps up material, which can go through flaps, kind of like a door flap for a cat or a dog. And then the material is pinned against a filter that runs around the circumference of this. And then this head is then brought back with that material. Whoops, I've gone page back. Uh, so just like all these other missions, we did an Earth gravity assist to help us get to the right orbit to meet the, the asteroid. The upper left shows a picture of the Earth-Moon system. Here's the Earth on the upper left and the Moon down the right. It gives you a kind of nice perspective on the sizes and distances of things. As luck would have it, our flyby uh, over the, the Earth took us pretty much straight over the Central Pacific. So um, it gives the impression that the Earth is pretty much totally covered with water. And it's actually mostly covered with water. But um, there is hints of land uh, down in the the uh, lower left, you can see Australia, and way up in the upper right is a little bit of California. Here, I'll, I'll wave my arms so you can see me, you'll see where that is. Um, and uh, we, this gave us a great chance to use our spectrometers to measure the spectrum of the Earth, see how things are working. And you can see we detected a whole series of uh, nice bands, oxygen, uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, ozone, and then also methane. So this is a very unequilibrated, atmosphere we're looking at here. So I don't want to shock anybody, but this is pretty strong evidence that there's life on Earth. Um, like I said, I don't want to shock you. Hopefully you're all aware of that. Uh, but this is a lovely way to kind of demonstrate that you can use a planet's atmosphere to detect the possible presence of life. Okay, so here's, uh, here's getting to know Bennu and Ryugu. So Itakawa's over here on the left for scale. Ryugu, I'm not gonna talk about much more, but um, uh, it's uh, a kilometer across. And then here's Bennu, which is uh, half a kilometer across. So these are all more or less to scale. Bennu is rotating for us, so you can see it. There's an obvious similarities between Ryugu and Bennu. Um, and this is true both compositionally and their, their shape, and that probably tells us a lot about their history. I won't go into a lot of detail about that. But, um, and so by 2023, we should have samples from both of these uh, objects on the right in the laboratory. And we already have samples from the object on the left. So again, here's Bennu to scale. So it's uh, um, small, but not that small. Uh, it's something like, it's a Bennu is a big impact hazard. If it hit the earth, it would not be a kill all life on earth kind of thing, it, but it would be a regional disaster. This is a uh, not good for Northern California kind of thing. Uh, so here's the, what some of the surface of Bennu actually looks like. So you can see the artist's conception from the, that video about the sample system is way off. <laughs> uh, and you can see the scale bar five meters here. There are very big boulders and there are smaller boulders and there are smaller boulders and there are smaller boulders. And, are smaller boulders, and uh, we have, data now that shows this goes all the way down. 
Uh, but the idea of being able to touch our sample pad down to a place where there'll be lots of material small enough to ingest, we can uh, suck up material less than two centimeters across, uh, is not something where we can just touch down any old place we want. Clearly we have um, uh, uh, to be, we have to look hard for a place to do our sampling. Uh, there are craters present, but most of the craters are sort of evident from the lack of boulders. They're, uh, their morphologies are not the kind of thing you see on the moon, and this is probably associated with, in large part, the fact it's a very small body with very low gravity, and so the dynamics of the whole cratering process are quite different. Um, and so we're learning a lot about cratering in a different kind of gravity strength regime than we've learned from other objects. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work going on in this area. Uh, so just to point out, uh, we actually orbit the, the body and it's such a small body and we orbit in so close we've gotten two Guinness Book of World Records for orbiting the smallest objects and orbiting the closest to something. Um, I don't know how much any of you care about that, but I think the thing I like about it is that it shows down here at the bottom that this is officially amazing. So I mean, I knew it was amazing, but it's nice to know it's officially amazing. That's nice. Um, our spectrometers uh, did the same thing at the, are doing the same thing at the asteroid they did when the Earth fly by. They're getting uh, pretty much full coverage of the asteroid. And uh, the top black spectra in these plots is the asteroid and below are spectra from various classes of carbonaceous chondrites. And you can see that generally the best fit is to CM carbonaceous chondrites, which is uh, um, great because that gives us a strong indication we'll bring back organics. CM carbonaceous chondrates contain a lot of organics and also these mineral bands are uh, um, um, a close match to hydrated uh, phyllosilicate. So we probably see the hydrosilicates, hydrated mineral, uh, minerals are present. There would have been at least uh, some amount of water present on this object at one time. Uh, one of the things that we were not expecting is it turns out Bennu is an active asteroid. It periodically spits particles off the surface and um, uh, these events can eject anywhere from one or two particles to large clusters of particles. Um, most of the ejected particles, uh, many of them can escape. The escape velocity from the surface is only, you know, can be as low as 10 centimeters a second at the equator. So you could jump off this asteroid without any trouble. Um, so many of them just leave, uh, but some uh, fall back to the surface and some actually go into temporary orbits that take a while to decide whether they want to leave or come back. Uh, why, how these ejections are driven is not entirely clear, but it may uh, be associated with thermal stress and cracking of the minerals. Uh, here's a plot that shows um, from the IR spectrometer is a, a plot of the temperature of the surface of Bennu uh, as it rotates and you can see there's an enormous temperature excursion here. At its hottest, it's up to around 350 at the equator, but on the back side, it gets down to about 200. So this is an enormous excursion in temperatures. And since the body orbits, it does a complete rotation in four hours, that means it only takes an hour to go from uh, around 200 degrees up to 350. So this is, means there's a lot of heating and cooling of the rocks going on. And this thermal stress may in fact um, cause the rocks to crack and break. And that may be the what's ejecting things. Also, I'd like you to note that the hottest spot on the asteroid is not right at noon, it's on the afternoon side. Um, that's true on the Earth too. And so this asymmetry is important because it causes the asteroid's orbit to divert from normal uh, straight Keplerian uh, tra trajectory. And this has a big uh, effect on where the asteroid, how its orbit evolves, which has a big effect on how we interpret its risk to the Earth as an impactor. So let me just talk a little bit about the Yarkovsky effect. So if you uh, look here on the left, if you have an asteroid that's rotating in a prograde fashion and its poles stick straight up and down out of the ecliptic plane, uh, then as it rotates, the hottest part of the asteroid will be the afternoon side and that will emit net radiation and that acts like a kind of little photon drive, a thrust, and that will push the asteroid in the outward direction. And so as this asteroid goes around in its orbit, it'll slowly move away from the sun. If the rotation were retrograde rotation, then the afternoon side's on the leading edge and it would slow the object down and that would cause it to come in. Uh, you can also get a seasonal effect if the pole is tilted at some level, you can have a place where one pole gets light all the time and the other gets nothing. And, and then you have times when um, uh, an area near the pole is always illuminated while the other one isn't. And then in this case, the net radiation is on the whole, uh, always coming out of the leading side. And so the seasonal effect only causes the orbit to, to decrease. 
And this is going on for Bennu. And uh, the radar measurements have allowed us to observe it deviating from its Keplerian gravity by 160 kilometers over a 12 year period. Um, so this means that this object cannot, its path cannot be predicted solely by just doing the Keplerian math uh, and watching its trajectory. And so you really need to understand this effect if you want to understand how Bennu represents a future risk for impact. It's also nice because it allows you to learn things about the, um, the actual mass of the object by seeing how it's, it's moved by this very weak but continuous force. So, uh, so Bennu's future, uh, it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's a very close approach to the Earth and its orbit is evolving in such a manner that shortly after 2100 uh, AD, it starts having chances to actually hit the Earth. And this goes on for like 150 years. Um, and so this really is uh, one of our biggest impact threats. And so we really want to understand things like the Zarkovsky effect because you don't want to decide that the thing is going to hit you, divert it in a manner that allows the Yarkovsky effect to bring it right back into collision. So in fact, um, you need to understand this effect if you want to properly assess the risk. And if you find out an impact is possible, that you do the right thing to mitigate it. Uh, so at the moment, we're worrying about our candidate sample sites. Um, we've uh, selected four candidate sample sites as sort of finalists, and they were chosen based on a number of scores for safety, sampleability, deliverability, and science value. So the safety is uh, we want to select a site that's um, uh, safe for the spacecraft. It has to go down uh, to the surface, touch, collect samples, and get away, and, we, and uh, the spacecraft needs to remain safe during all of that. So that's obviously a, an, an ultimate requirement. Uh, we also want to go to a place where we have uh, sampleable material. As I mentioned, the collector can ingest material up to two centimeters in diameter, so we don't want to land in a rock field of five centimeter rocks. So we have to find a place that's sampleable. Uh, and then we have to have deliverability, which means that it has to be in a location a spacecraft can actually maneuver into and out of. So for example, you wouldn't want to sample a lovely patch of sampleable material that's a one foot to the left of a 10 meter boulder because the spacecraft would then also have you know, safety issues and, uh, and uh, you wouldn't be able to get into that position uh, by in your in terms of your trajectory. And then of course you want the a high science value for the sample. So fortunately there's basically nothing on Bennu that doesn't have high science value. So all four sites have very high science value. That's not really a sheep from goat separator for the mission. And so uh, the chosen sites for the uh, <coughs> primary and backup are Nightingale and Osprey. Um, and uh, the sample collection is scheduled for later this year. We're still doing uh, sort of rehearsals to practice descents uh, to make sure that the, the navigation system works and that the uh, location still looks good. Here's a, a, a spread out map of the overall asteroid surface and you can see Nightingale up here um, in the uh, upper left uh, corner and then Osprey is down closer to the uh, equatorial band here. Um, here's a few Here's pictures of the two sites and this little profile shows you uh, a silhouette of the size of the spacecraft to give you a, a sense of scale. You can see both of the selected places are craters where bigger boulders have been moved aside. They, and uh, if anybody has uh, red green or, or red blue glasses, I've put 3D images of these two down below. Um, if, if you don't have those, don't worry about it. Um, these are the same basic fields of view, although there's rotations in here. So these are, uh, so hopefully later this year, we'll be going down to Nightingale uh, after having done um, some more preliminary work and collecting a sample from here. The spacecraft has the ability to actually try to sample three times. So if we go down and it doesn't work the first time, uh, we can try again and again, but the, the, the hope and the plan is to go down and get all the material we need in the first attempt and then we'll be ready to stow it and um, come back to Earth to study it. So here's just a, a, an image showing the checkpoint uh, rehearsal movie that just shows the sample head deployed down while uh, we did a practice descent and return. Uh, just to give you a sense of the surface, it's uh, not anything like the artist's conception, which is making things more of a challenge for us. <laughs> So I'll just end by saying, you know, to remember that return samples are a legacy that will be used by scientists for years to come. We're still studying samples from the moon, from the Apollo missions, and uh, we're still studying the Stardust samples, samples from Itakawa. The same will be true for the samples from Ryugu and Bennu. 
And um, for, I don't know uh, if, how many of the folks who are on here are, are students, but, um, or uh, uh, people who work on extraterrestrial materials, or would like to be working on extraterrestrial materials, but all of these materials are available into the future. And so we will continue to learn from these things. There's still lots of work to be done. And maybe some of you can, uh, can and will help do that. So uh, here's, I'm gonna end in a picture showing the Stardust uh, aerogel tray. And you can see right here on the right side, two cells have just been removed. So these are the first samples taken out to be studied. But you can see there's a lot of cells left there to be studied in the future. And I'll end there. So let's see, do I, I need to stop sharing my screen, I guess. Stop sharing. And then uh, Brian, I think I need to open up somehow the uh, <clears throat> chat window, right? In case people have been asking questions. <coughs> oh, I see. Um, Okay, I see a question from Ellen. Uh, how was the aerogel tested on Earth before launching on Stardust? That's a great question. Uh, fortunately, our flyby velocity of six kilometers a second is a velocity that can just barely be attained by uh, uh, light gas guns. So there's a, a basically, a, a, and they call it a gun, but it's like a cannon here at NASA Ames that can fire a projectile at just about six kilometers a second. And so we were able to take aerogel and put it in the vacuum chamber at the bottom of this gun and then fire dust grains into it. And we could pick the grains we fired so we knew exactly what their composition was, then take the aerogel out, extract grains that were fired into it and find out how much they were changed. And so we could demonstrate that for, you know, most mineral grains could survive this process reasonably well. Organics don't survive as well. And so one of the problems with the Stardust samples is that many of the organics we do see or that were present were probably utterly destroyed. And the ones we do see, many of them were altered. Um, so organics don't do so well. We actually fired some Nestle's hot cocoa powder into aerogel and the material that was collected didn't look much like Nestle's cocoa powder. So we had for uh, maybe a, a you know a few milliseconds the world's hottest hot cocoa <laughs> mix, but um, it demonstrated that organics don't do well. But uh, this allowed us to actually test and know that the aerogel would work for a large fraction of the grains. Uh, let's see. I see a question from Sherry. Could the diurnal temperature fluctuations be caused be causing aqueous alteration of the minerals in the present day? And if so, is there a way to determine the timing of the alteration, present day versus some past? That's, um, that's a great question. Um, certainly hydrated silicates, when they're heated to 350 degrees C, will lose water that's in them in interstitial. So water in hydrated silicates can lie in several locations. It can be interstitial, so it can be actual water molecules stuck between the layers of the mineral. And then uh, you can also have OH uh, structural units within the mineral that serve to bridge the layers of the layer lattice silicate. And so uh, temperatures of 350, you will over time drive out uh, the water. And so that would affect, um, uh, that would be a, a change in the aqueous alteration state for that material. To get the structural OH out, you usually have to get up to closer to five or 600 degrees. So the current temperature on the surface isn't high enough to drive that. Um, uh, but it's, but most of the hydrated minerals we're seeing on uh, Bennu probably were created via aqueous alteration that happened very early in the history of the body back at the beginning. And back then the heating, the main heating source probably would not have been the sun, but would have been uh, radionuclides that were captured along with the, all the other materials things like aluminum 26, which decayed very quickly and they created for most small bodies in the solar system a, a heat pulse early in the solar system's history that warmed things, uh, larger bodies up. And so there, if there was liquid water on this object around, it probably mostly was present um, you know, back at the very beginning, four and a half billion years ago or something. Um, and so that's probably when most of the aqueous alteration happened. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. I see uh, something from Maria about uh, is there a reason for the shape of the sample return container? I assume you mean the sample return capsule, the overall capsule. And yes, that shape is um, very important. Uh, 
the capsule is designed so that when you release it, you give it a little bit of a spin. That helps stabilize it, but you need that front cone to be the part forward because that has the thickest heat shield and that's what's going to protect you from um, uh, the atmosphere as you re-enter. So we re-entered the Earth's atmosphere over 12 kilometers a second. And so this vaporizes away the front edge of the heat shield. And so if the capsule was allowed to tumble or change its orientation, it would have burned up and broken up. So uh, that shape is designed so that when you give it a little spin, the front stays the front <laughs> and the back stays the back. Otherwise, uh, the, the, the sample just wouldn't survive back to the surface. Uh, I see a question, how was the sample extracted from the aerogel? Um, there were several ways to do that. Um, one of the ways is you could actually cut out a little blob of aerogel around a track and then either use micro manipulators and needles to extract individual grains. This is a little bit the way you get particles off of um, collectors from U-2 aircraft when we collect dust in the stratosphere. Or you could also inject a, like epoxy if you weren't worried about organic contamination. You could inject epoxy into the track and let it solidify and then ultra take that out and ultra microtome it into slices and then you slice down and like you're slicing through salami or something until you find a, a, a thin section of the grain and then you can study that. So there were several ways of getting it out. Um, that was a real challenge. When we launched, we knew we could get material into the aerogel and it could survive. Um, but we actually spent some of the time the spacecraft was in flight sort of learning how to get samples out to study them. And that's still a bit of a challenge. Um, in particular, for very fine grain materials, like the kinds of stuff that comes off at the top of these bulbous tracks, um, it's very hard to get individual grains out of the aerogel. And in fact, the impact melts some of the aerogel. And so you've got silicate minerals embedded in melted silicate glass. And so that makes it sometimes difficult to know. And some of the comet material melted as well. And so there is material where um, it, it's not clear how much of the material is the aerogel and how much is the comet and then how badly that comet material was altered. Um, so in general, um, the nicest thing is when you find a grain like that one I showed where you had that big iron sulfide grain acted as a kind of snowplow ahead of the rest of the material and pretty much everything behind that iron sulfide was protected and didn't get mixed in with aerogel. Um, uh, what do I think a cryogenic sample return capsule would look like? Well, um, if you bring a capsule back and you can keep it in the shade of the spacecraft, you can keep it um, below, well below uh, uh, freezing uh, all without doing anything to it. Um, so, and uh, when a capsule enters the atmosphere, it looks like this giant glowing fireball, but um, the heat doesn't penetrate into the capsule uh, in, during the actual deceleration. The heat doesn't penetrate into the capsule faster than the capsule actually ablates. And so the inside of the capsule doesn't see any heat at all through most of the reentry. It's only after it lands and the remaining part of the heat shield that's hot starts to heat soak into the interior. So you can do a certain degree of cryogenic return simply by grabbing the capsule as quickly as possible and getting it into a refrigerator. <laughs> but if you want to be deeply cryogenic, you want to store stuff at a temperature where ices could survive, then you probably need to either put a, a, an active cryo cooler on the capsule, uh, which is difficult because that's a lot of mass and power requirement, uh, or you need to put in a large mass that can be a thermal heat soak. So you, you, know, you put in a, a bunch of mass that isn't the sample that you can get really, really cold before you re-enter and, and then it acts like the ice cubes in your, in your, uh, in your uh, igloo um, to keep things cold. So there's a couple of ways to do this. It makes things a lot more complicated and it does require, in most cases, that you have to get to the capsule as fast as you possibly can because the longer you wait, the more likely it is to warm up. And if you brought back a sample with ices and you let it warm up enough, those ices melted, then you have a real disaster because you've lost the ices and uh, the liquid you've gotten has altered the rest of the sample. And so now, instead of having really primordial primitive stuff from the object, you have a mess. <laughs> so that's a real challenge. Okay, uh, let's see, is there anything, am I missing anything else? Uh, Brian, you know this better than I do, so uh, please I, feel free to chime in if I'm missing something. I do see one more question in here from uh, Maeve from Dublin, Ireland. She's asking, uh, how have curation techniques changed through time, and does this present difficulties with reanalyzing older samples, e.g. Apollo samples, in case of contamination? 
Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, if you, I mentioned the value, one of the values of these samples is that you can use them into the future, but that value is, is decreased if you don't store the samples properly. And it's hard to do a perfect job, but um, uh, so it, um, the way NASA handles samples is the samples are kept in the curatorial facilities. They're stored under, generally stored under dry, ultra pure nitrogen. Uh, and some of the samples are even set aside and put in a bunker <laughs> in New Mexico so that if, you know, Houston has, you know, gets a hurricane and everything gets flooded, there's still sample somewhere else. Um, so, but even this isn't perfect. So for example, if you um, uh, have volatiles present, and uh, even if they're not super volatile, but just water, uh, dry nitrogen, they'll slowly, these things will slowly evaporate out. And so samples do change over time, uh, if for no other reason than the uh, components within the sample can interact with each other and now they're generally at room temperature, not whatever temperature they might originally been at in the parent body. So things do change over time. And uh, so you try to store the things you're not studying as, in as pristine a fashion as you can. And if people ask for samples to study, and you can provide them with adequate samples that have already been studied, you, you tend to send those out rather than opening up anything new. Uh, but you do sometimes need to store things in a manner where you explicitly set a sample aside to look at later because you think technology, for example, will be uh, better at a later date and you shouldn't use up the whole sample now. And there's a perfect example of that going on right now. And that is that um, when the Apollo uh, landings happened, samples were taken. And several of the samples they took were drive cores, where they basically pounded a pipe into the ground to get a core deep into the ground. And uh, one of those was, uh, at least one, was vacuum sealed when it was brought back and set aside. And nobody did anything with it. And it's been in a vacuum since the minute it was captured. And so this sample ought to have been almost completely unaltered since that time. And it's been sitting uh, in the curatorial facility for, um, you know, whatever now, 50 years or something. And it was finally decided that the technology had incre increased so much since the original Apollo days that it was time to take it out and allocate it to folks. And so just this past <clears throat> year, they, NASA announced the, that they were going to make this material available, allowed people to write proposals to suggest what they would do with it. And uh, people were selected to study it and they are now doing that. And so there was a case where someone had a long range vision that you know took 50, it's taking 50 years to come to fruition. And so this is a kind of mental outlook you need to have for these curatorial facilities. It's not enough to protect the sample from contamination today or to minimize contamination while you're looking at it right now, but you want the samples to be um, as pristine as possible for as long as possible. And so this, for example, is a real challenge, again, for cryogenic missions. Suppose you manage to get a cryogenic sample and ice from a comet, let's say, back to the Earth. You get it, the capsule back and you, you don't melt it. Uh, now you have to curate it that way and you have to keep it below those temperatures all the time you're handling it while you're preparing to send samples to people. And you have to be able to send them to people still cryogenic. And so there can be, a, you know, there's really, a huge amount of technology development required for a task like that. Um, and so um, sample return missions are, are different from other missions in a couple of key ways. One, of course, is not that you don't have to get there and measure things. You have to get there and measure things. Then you have to do close body operations to get the sample. And then you have to get back. That's all makes them much more difficult. But then you have to have pre-thought out all this curatorial stuff. It has to be ready to go when the sample comes back. And you have to, and, and this can be a real challenge in part because you don't know what the samples are going to look like when they come back. So you can guess what they're going to be like based on the measurements you made at the asteroid or the comet or whatever. Um, but you will undoubtedly be surprised by some things when the sample comes back. So you need to uh, not only have a good plan well in advance, but the plan has to be adaptable. It has to allow you to realize that there are other issues that need to be done. Uh, that need to be addressed. And um, so uh, for sample return missions, um, you have parts of the budget you don't have in other missions. You have to make sure you have budgeted money to deal with this curatorial stuff. There's no point in bringing back a sample that's then subsequently abused. Um, so, so that's an important part of the mission. That's a great question.
And then I think we have one last question and it was from uh, the co-organizer, Katie. She's asking if Bennu's orbit does in fact uh, eventually coincide with Earth, have any preliminary strategies been developed to prevent impacts? Uh, uh, well, yes and no. There, there are groups who um, worry specifically about impacts. They're not necessarily focused only on Bennu, but just in general on how you, one would divert an object. Um, and uh, you know, if it's small enough, you don't worry about it. You let the atmosphere protect you from it. Uh, but then you start to get up to a size like we had for the Chelyabinsk impact, where uh, if it comes down over a city, you can hurt a lot of people and break a lot of windows and so on. If you get up to the Bennu size scale, then the impact, like I said, starts becoming a sort of regional disaster. Um, it would be uh, something you would definitely want to prevent if you could. And there are various ways to do that, and they depend to some extent on the nature of the object you're trying to divert. And... Um, uh, and, uh, and the details of that object. So as I just pointed out um, in my talk, Bennu is wandering uh, off its Keplerian orbit because of this Yarkovsky effect. Okay, so Bennu is almost jet black. Its albedo is like 3%, so it's darker than a charcoal briquette. And so that means that it's getting, it gets very hot as you saw in those thermal plots. And so the thermal thrust for the Yarkovsky effect is quite large. And so that's causing a diversion of the asteroid's uh, overall trajectory. So if you were to determine in the future that the asteroid would, you know, in a hundred years, uh, potentially go through a keyhole in its orbit that would bring it back in a subsequent orbit to hit the Earth, one of the ways you could potentially protect the Earth would be to change the magnitude of the Yarkovsky effects and so that it didn't migrate as much as it is currently migrating and that might allow you to miss the keyhole in an orbit that would bring you back to another impact orbit. So for example you might be able to save the planet you know by going up and painting Bennu white. So I save the world with paint. Um, uh, if the object gets too big, then the Yarkovsky effect becomes weak, and then that then you can't divert things much that way unless you have huge amounts of time. So uh, other ways people talk about, and there's always a group that would like the idea of, of nuking it, um, the, uh, and one of the ways you would do that is to set off a nuclear warhead at a distance from it that would uh, heat up one side of the asteroid, cause vaporization to shoot off of it, and that would act as a thrust that would um, push the asteroid to the side. Uh, that can work, but you, you don't want the thrust to be so high that it disrupts the body, and many of these objects are, are rubble piles, so it's not clear how strong they are. Um, uh, you know, for example, I'm not sure you could park an, a, a rocket on Itakawa and use that to push Itakawa around because the rocket might just burrow into the surface and push boulders aside, unless it's a very weak thrust. Um, uh, uh, so there, there are a number of strategies that have been discussed, but all, most of these strategies have to account specifically for the nature of the object you're trying to move. Its size, its shape, its uh, rotational axis relative to that shape, uh, how much time you have to divert it, and so on. So in the case of Bennu, given that the Yarkovsky effect is large, uh, I would like I would believe that uh, if you knew well enough in advance that it might hit, that I would be <laughs> inclined to use the Yarkovsky effect to help you and go up there and, and paint it. And um, in fact, you could paint it more than once so you could steer it a bit so that it was not only not going to have the impact, but was going to be in a new orbit that would never be likely to give you a future impact. All right. I think that was all of our questions. I'll go ahead and... Uh conclude today's uh, talk. So we would like to once again thank Dr. Sanford for an amazing talk uh, and thank our audience for joining us uh, every week and uh, being so engaged with us. Uh, and we'd like to remind everyone that coming up this Thursday, uh, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Nuevo from NASA Ames uh, speaking about the formation of the building blocks of life in astrophysical environments. 1 p.m. this Thursday, we hope we see everyone there. Yeah, right. I'll put out uh, Mike, uh, my, Michelle and I um, work in the same laboratory here at NASA Ames. I didn't talk about any of my astrochemistry laboratory stuff. He'll give a great talk uh, and you'll learn a lot about how to make uh, astrobiologically relevant molecules abiotically.
<laughs> and thanks for sticking with me. I know I went too long, so I appreciate the fact folks being patient. All right. Have a good day, everybody.